But we've been talking about uh, unbelief. And uh, some of the things that should happen to us should happen, but they don't happen. And many times it's because we, we don't believe. Other times we lack the passion to possess the things of God. For many years, I had a problem with uh, the guy that struck the ground with the arrows. And uh, the prophet asked him to strike the ground and he struck it only three times. And the prophet was angry. And he said, why didn't you strike it five, six, or seven times? Why just three? And I, I read that and I, I thought, you didn't tell the guy how many times you should strike. So what's the problem? And the Lord began to minister to me that the problem is not the strike. The problem is lack of passion committed to the strike he could have struck it once but he needed to commit his heart and soul passion into what he was doing many times we can't uh, we can't perform a miracle but many times the miracle bypasses us because there is no passion are you alright so when you pray, the, the passionate prayer of a righteous man avails much. And sometimes things that we should be able to walk into with ease, we don't because there's a lack of passion. Uh, you look at the guy Joshua who's just finished slaughtering the kings, ungodly kings and their armies, and the sun was going down, and he said to God, God, stop the sun! Now, he's already had a gigantic victory, meaning the blood of the, the heathens flowed through the land, and he's fought from morning till night and then he said God stop the sun and God listened to the guy what was it that he had he had passion and many times when there's a lack of passion we stop the miraculous because of lack of passion added to that we stop the miraculous because we don't live by faith, even though we believe. The man that came to Jesus when Jesus descended from the mountain of transfiguration and there was a kafafo, there was a crowd and, uh, and what's going on? And the man came home and said, I brought my demon possessed son to, to your disciples and they couldn't cast it, the demon out. And Jesus said, uh, what's wrong with you? How long do I have to be with you for you to learn to believe? And then Jesus said to them, to the, now this, he's saying this to the crowd and to, and then the disciples, and then he said to the man, everything and anything is possible to him that believe. Anything, 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 everything. When the thing does not start with what we have, the thing starts with faith. And uh, the man said, I believe, but help my unbelief. And many times we believe, but we don't believe. <laughs> hello, hello. I'm just trying to get, you know, I'm very passionate about this stuff, you know. I think you know that. It's not, I'm not angry, I'm just passionate about it. I believe, but help my unbelief. 
And then Jesus said to the disciples when they got into the house, said, how come we couldn't cast that demon out? This one comes out by, by prayer and fasting. You, you see, in, in, the, in a, the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus put three things together. Prayer, fasting, and giving. All three. If you pray, go into your closet. <laughs> Have you got a closet? <laughs> if you give, or when you give, when you pray, when you give, and when you fast. They all go together. And sometimes we need to pray with passion, fast with passion, understanding, and give with passion. We don't tip God. You know? We give. Hallelujah. So, the Bible says, chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remained of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short. He can promise, but it doesn't happen. And it's not his fault. He can promise you something, but that doesn't mean that it's going to happen. You have to possess it by faith. So these people began a journey from Egypt. About three million people. Well, I'm just trying to calculate. Because there was about 600,000 uh, women. So uh, 600,000 women would have a, that means a, and every time there's, every, everywhere there's women, there's children. And so, uh, I think 600,000, 600,000 men. But it's about 3,000 people all came out. You know how many people that came out arrived? Two. That's very poor statistics. The rest that arrived were born in the wilderness but the ones that started the journey, only two arrived. So they started the journey, but they did not finish it well. Only Caleb and Joshua were the ones that started from Egypt that arrived. The rest were born on the journey. They saw the glory of God, but they still could not believe. I mean, if you see the fire of God at night, literally, it will lead a nation to God. And they saw that. They saw the fire of God. They saw the cloud in the day. They drank from the rock and they ate from heaven. God just opened the heavens every morning and dropped down pancakes. I mean, manna. So they had to collect that every month. So, so they saw this miraculous God performing. Now that was in the wilderness. This is the amazing thing. The wilderness was not their destination. Yet they saw the miraculous in the wilderness. Their destination was a land that's flowing with milk and honey. Where do you get milk from? Supermarket. <laughs> Okay. That's from a teacher. My niece is a teacher in Oakland. She said to the kids, where do you get milk from? And everyone said, supermarket. <laughs> they have no idea it came from cows. But here is a land flowing. There must be a lot of cows there. I won't go into that. Flowing with milk and honey. So even though there was this miraculous stuff in the wilderness... That's not where they were heading. They were heading past the wilderness to this land flowing with milk and honey. Now, I said something I'm going to say again. I don't know if you remember, but uh, you can actually, as a Christian, live in Egypt. Or as a Christian, live in the wilderness. Or as a Christian, live in the promised land. But it's up to you. There are many Christians who are born again. By the blood that we sang about on the doorpost, 
but they're still living with the mindset of Egypt. Some of them have come out, but they live in the wilderness. And then some have come out and live in the promised land. But it's according to us. It's not according to the one that delivered us. He has given us exceeding and precious promises that in fulfilling them, we become partakers of the divine nature. Now, how many people can say, I, I'm a partaker of the divine nature? Because we're meant to be, we're meant to be supernatural. But if you look at the church, the church is anything but supernatural. Why? Because we are still people that need to live by faith. You don't live according to your profession. You don't live according to your income. You don't live according to your bank balance. You don't live according to your understanding. Trust the Lord with a, all your heart and don't lean. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have understanding, but don't lean on it. Because if you lean on your own personal understanding, you'll miss God a million miles. Hello? So the question is, are you living in Egypt? Because if you are, you need to get out. Are you living in the wilderness? Because if you are, that's not your destiny. Your destiny is in a land flowing with milk and honey. The only difficulty is <laughs> there are enemies here. The promises are yes and are men in Christ by who? By us. So the promises are yes and are men. But we have to get in and possess it. So it warns us that there is a, a rest that many of us will come short of it because we have to get in and possess our promises. So when Joshua fought the people that were possessing his promise and he saw the sun descending was going to set, he said, God, stop the sun. And God did. Joshua never thought that a centrifugal force that causes the planetary system to rotate is so powerful that if you stop it, the whole thing will go into chaos. He didn't, he didn't think about that. He was, he was not a scientist. He was a man of faith. And he never thought that if the sun could shine on one particular place and never move, the place will burn up. He never thought about that. What? He's a man of faith. Most of our faith calculates first before we believe. So, the writer to the Hebrews, Samon Neyman, Paul. I'm saying that for the benefit of those that are watching. But the guy said Paul wrote the Hebrews. Paul never wrote Hebrews. Well, as a Samoan, you're told by your pastor when you're young that Paul wrote Hebrews. So, if you're listening and you're a Bible scholar, I am sorry, but Paul wrote Hebrews, okay? <laughs> this is a matter of faith. Hallelujah. Are you okay? So, the promises that are yes and amen will never happen because to, for it to happen, it's yes and amen in Christ by, by me. God may promise you everything and nothing will ever happen. Why? Because I have to possess it. All right, some people go pray for it.
we are still the people that are meant to live by faith. The Bible says that God has given to everyone a measure of faith. Everyone. And there are people who are not in church who have learned to mix whatever little faith they have with what they do. I was thinking this morning, I had a ride in one of those electric cars. That thing is faster than Lamborghini. But it's invented by a guy who doesn't even know the Lord. Unless he got saved in the last two days. But whatever little faith was measured to him, he's learned to mix that in with the creativity that God has given to him. We said a few at the beginning of the year, or maybe the beginning of last year, that it is possible never to be saved and still build an empire. Why? Because you're made in the image of God. You may be heathen to the bone and still build an empire. Because you're made in the image of a God who creates everything. And God has given to everyone a measure of faith. Hallelujah. I was sharing the leaders on Friday night that when we were young Christians, we had this raw faith that seems to overcome obstacles. And then we get very educated and forget about that. But when you were first illuminated, have a look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Verse uh, 32. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated. One day you were in darkness and the next day you were in light. And something just exploded inside your heart. And then this is what he says. You endured a great struggle with suffering. You did not care. You endured what? One day you were in darkness, one day you were dead, the next day you were alive. You were in darkness, now you're light. And the Bible tells us, remember those days when you were first illuminated with the gospel. Then he tells you what, that you endure great sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulation, reproaches and tribulation. Now when we reproach, we get so annoyed. Let me say something to you that will bless, bless you and bless me. Offenses are inevitable. Bitterness is a choice. Uh, uh, that's good. Offenses are inevitable. You'll get it everywhere, even in churches. But how you respond to that offense is your choice and my choice. Are you okay? Then verse 34. For you had compassion on me in my chains. You know when he first got saved, you prayed? Now you hardly pray. You prayed for your family. You prayed for the unsaved friends. You can't even shut up. There was such a passion in your heart because you just got illuminated with the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. And then he says, uh, you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. <laughs> I like that. The plundering of your goods. 
knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Remember when you first got saved and you give an offering? He didn't care. Now he cares. Uh, a, a minister in Auckland, if he's watching the thing, he's, he knows I'm talking to him. But he said to Ben at a, at a conference offering, he said, Ben, don't get your pastor to take the offering. I empty my wallet when he does. <laughs> and then he said to him, how does he get away saying the thing he does? <laughs> it's called grace. Well, that's what I call it anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we have to mix this stuff with faith. And sometimes, like Paul said, talking about his body, sometimes I have to put my body under control. Lest after I have preached, I become a castaway. If Paul had a problem with the passion of his flesh, everybody will have problems with their flesh. So sometimes you have to take control and think about what you're thinking about. Some people just think all over the place. Think about what you're thinking about. Is it in faith or is it not? Because we are still people that live by faith. So the prophet Habakkuk, when he was talking to God, and he was complaining, he said, give me a break. You know, how do you suppose I live in the midst of the chaos and the darkness and the brokenness? How do you expect me to live? God said, the just shall live by faith. And then you come to the little book of John. You know, there's a big John and little John. Little John wrote, uh, <laughs> well, well, little John wrote Revelation and he wrote the book of John and he wrote, he wrote the little, the three little books of John. He said, by faith we overcome. He that is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Everyone can live in the light of their own understanding, but the man and the woman of God lives by his faith. Now let me make one point and then I'll close. Sometimes we confuse faith and trust. Faith and trust are used synonymously in our vocabulary, but they're not necessarily the same all the time. What's the name of the guy that uh, was a tight rope across the Niagara Fall? Some of you would know his name. And everybody came, some on the other side, and some on the United States and Canadian side, and, and he walked across. It was quite a lengthy walk on this tight rope. And everybody was cheering. And they said, he said, who believes I can walk across on uh, stilts? Well, so he did. And then he said, uh, I think he went, went across and, and, and cook a little omelet in the middle of a, and then, and then he, he took a wheelbarrow and put some sacks of potatoes, I think it was, and wheeled the thing across, and everybody, woo, woo, woo. He says, that sack of potatoes had the weight of a man. Now who can come and put it, sit in the wheelbarrow while I wheel them across? Nobody did. Why? There's a huge difference between believing in the power of God and trusting that that power is available to you. Huge difference. There's a huge difference between believing in God and accepting Christ. You trust. Now, let me give you another 
Example. You can believe God to save you up to the door of the lion's den. But what happens when the lion's den door does not close and you go in? Right there, you have to trust. You trust in the character of the one that promised. Our, our problem is we live in unbelief because we don't trust the character yeah. of the one that promised. Yeah. I believe, but help my unbelief. If that is you, I want you to stand to your feet because I want to pray for us. Father, we thank you and bless your name. We believe, but help our unbelief. Help us to learn to trust in you. Many times we calculate how we believe. Joshua never calculated how he did it. He just knew that there was a need and he knew that there was a God that is faithful to meet that need. And he cried. And there was never a day before then and after then where God heard the voice of a man and God did it. Lord, we pray that in this congregation that people will cry out and you will hear from heaven. You will forgive our sins and you will heal our land. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that your hand will rest upon this church. That there will be a spirit of faith that will arise in the heart of everyone, from the youngest to the eldest. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. While you're standing, if you're standing and you've never given your life to Jesus, you want to give your heart to the Lord today, to put your trust in Him for the rest of your life, to entrust your life into His hands, can you come? Because I'd love to pray for you. If there's anybody, you will come, I'll pray with you.